I've done a number of videos so far on authentication and specifically focusing on two-factor authentication. What I wanted to do in this video is talk about yet another mechanism for authentication, which I don't think it's talked about that much, but which is actually very prominently used by a number of institutions. So I'm going to do a quick recap. When you look at two-factor authentication, there are typically uh, three things that you might want to look at in the context of doing authentication. Uh, so the first thing is what you know, which typically is something like a password, maybe a PIN. Uh, in the physical world, it could be a combination or a combination lock and so on. Uh, what you have is another capability or another mechanism by which you can perform authentication. And by what you have, I mean things like, you know, in the physical world, it will be a driver's license. In the online world, it might be the value on your two-factor authentication token. So it may be a string of digits on a hardware device that only you're supposed to know about where that string of digits is, is changing frequently. Uh, and the third way in which people can get authenticated is via what you are. And by that, what's typically meant is a biometric. For example, uh, your fingerprint, and you can put that on a fingerprint scanner, or your retina, which can then be scanned using a retinal scanner and so on and so forth. And in general, when we talk about multi-factor authentication, we mean using more than one of these factors. And the most common case is what we call two-factor authentication, which involves using uh, two things, like for example, what you know and what you have. And, and typically in the online world, the what you have piece is labeled or is typically associated with something like a two-factor authentication token, uh, for example, a hardware token. Now there's a fourth factor, which is not typically talked about, but actually is quite common. And that fourth factor is actually what you do. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's, uh, let's illustrate that via an example. Uh, so imagine that you log into your bank's website. So you have a, you know, so you have a bank and uh, you are uh, logged in uh, to your bank's website. And let, let's imagine you've got a web browser. The web browser is connected to your bank site and the user is uh, using the web browser to conduct uh, transactions uh, on their bank account from their home, let's say. Now, what you will do typically when you log into your bank site is you're going to provide your basic information. You'll provide your username, uh, your password, uh, you might provide a, uh, a two-factor authentication token value and, and a bunch of other things, whatever the bank requires. Uh, and then you've established a session with your bank. And the idea then is that over that session, you can then conduct additional transactions. Now it turns out that there are other attributes of your session and really other attributes of your transaction that are occurring during your session that can be useful in the context of figuring out whether or not this is a legitimate user who is conducting the transaction. Uh, so what are some of the other interesting attributes? So for example, and this is something that your bank is most likely looking at, I think a lot of the major banks certainly look at this information. Uh, so for example, a bank might also examine the IP address. In other words, what is your location on the internet? The IP address stands for the internet protocol address. And it turns out that anybody who has an internet connection underneath has an internet protocol address that they use uh, that basically identifies their location on the internet. Now it turns out that if you know someone's IP address, you can in many cases figure out uh, roughly what their geographic location is. It's not always precise, um, but that gives you an indication of where the user is coming from. Uh, so for example, let's say the bank saw you log in uh, five minutes ago and you were coming from home where you typically log in. And then five minutes later, they see you coming in from some foreign location. Uh, the bank will know something is wrong with that second transaction. And it's likely that the second transaction, that second login is fraudulent because it seems to be coming from a different location than you typically come from. So there are analytics you can perform on the IP address that's used during the course of a login. Uh, a bank can also look for things like uh, the time that you log in. So for example, let's say you normally log in to your bank's website on uh, Saturday afternoon to pay your bills, something along those lines. If suddenly the bank sees you log in at two o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, they'll know something is not quite right because that's not when you typically will conduct your banking business online. Okay. Uh, you can also look at things like what you did when you logged in. Uh, this is actually maybe a bit more subtle, but typically when you uh, when you log into your bank's website, you'll typically engage in a pattern of activities that might be unique to you. So for example, uh, let's say that when you typically log into your bank, you might do things like uh, 
uh, check your bank balance first, and then you'll go to the bill pay page and maybe make a transaction through a vendor that you've typically transacted with in the past and, and that sort of thing. And the idea is that it, it turns out that most people have their own unique pattern of things that they particularly do uh, when they log into their bank site. Now, if the bank suddenly sees that you are not conducting a transaction that's part of your typical pattern, uh, they may get suspicious. And if they see something radically different, they see a different IP address, they see a different time, they see a different series of activities. Let's say the activity happens to be that you, uh, instead of doing what you normally do, they suddenly see you do things like change your email address to something different and then make a huge transaction to some third party that you've never done business with before uh, and so on and so forth they may flag that, they may realize something is not quite right. And in that case, if the bank notices that some attributes of your session are anomalous, they can do things. Well, you know, what, what can they do? They can obviously do things like block the transaction, right? Uh, they can ask you for more information. Uh, the bank can also do things like uh, uh, confirm the transaction through some other means. For example, a lot of times the bank will, will call you. And this may be typical, you might see your credit card company do this as well when you uh, buy something unusual, oftentimes your credit card company will call you on the phone to say, hey, did you mean to make this transaction? Because it's not what you typically will see. All right. Now, I believe that some banks have gone as far, and I, and I think this is somewhat accurate, uh, they've gone as far as to say that in many cases, they don't even care about the password. Uh, and that might sound strange, but they pretty much assume that your password either can or, or has been compromised by somebody. And so what they end up doing is they put a lot of stock into these other attributes. They put a lot of stock into the other signals or attributes associated with your session. They look at things like when you came to the bank and, and how you got there and what you did because they know that's actually a lot harder to fake uh, at a baseline, whereas your password is something that can easily become compromised and get into the hands of a third party. Now, I've done some other videos on two-factor authentication. I've also done a video that looks at two-factor authentication in the context of a session hijacking Trojan, uh, as well as uh, videos on man in the browser malware. And it's important to note that when it comes to things like session hijacking Trojans or uh, a man in the browser malware, that type of malware has a higher likelihood of going undetected, even in this model where the bank looks at what you do. And the reason for that is that in many cases, for many of the attributes, the uh, man in the browser malware or the session hijacking malware will basically mimic, it'll have the exact same attributes uh, for, for many aspects or many many of these attributes will be the same. So for example, uh, the IP address will will match what you typically use. Uh, your, uh, your time might match what you typically use. The reason for that is that the man in the browser Trojan or the, the uh, session hijacking Trojan piggybacks on top of a legitimate session. So the bank will see that you've logged in from the same place at the same time using your password and your two-factor token. The only thing that might trip the bank or make the bank realize something is wrong is the activity. And so in this case, the bank has uh, some solace. They can, they can actually try to look for malicious activity. They have some recourse, something to look for uh, in terms of being able to find out whether or not you've done something that's fraudulent or whether or not a fraudulent transaction took place from your computer. But because they have less information to go on, it's harder for them to make a more conclusive determination. It's hard for them to be more confident because they only have a handful of, of attributes that they can address or that they can leverage as opposed to the full set of attributes. And, and the reason this is of a concern to a bank is that uh, banks have to be careful because they don't want to have a false positive either. Uh, a bank doesn't want a situation in which a legitimate transaction was blocked because it looked like an anomaly, since that'll cause an inconvenience to their users that might lead to a call to their, their help desk or support and so on. So there's a cost that a bank has to incur if it incorrectly blocks a transaction that was legitimate. And the less information the bank has to go on, the more likely it is that they can make a mistake in this particular case. But hopefully having said that, I think that a lot of banks, I want to point out, do use techniques like this. They use techniques like this just like they would use your username and password. But I think that often these other techniques don't get talked about because it's not uh, as, as, uh, as prominent, it's not as, it's not as overt as using something like a, a password or a two-factor token to validate a transaction. But I just want to point out that it, it does happen, uh, and I'm sure you can imagine other types of attributes that you may want to use in the context of being able to do uh, multi-factor authentication, especially when it comes to the what you do piece of it.